<laughs> awesome. Okay. All right, so um, today our guest speaker is Gabriel Kwan. He is a professor at USC Annenberg, and he's going to be telling us about journalism and why it's broken and how data can fix it. Let's okay. welcome Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for taking some time out uh, for this. It's really uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to get to talk to you guys. Um, this will be the most non-technical talk that's ever taken place in these four walls. <laughs> I've read some of the other uh, the titles and abstracts of the other talks, and I really can't even understand the abstracts. Um, but I think that there's a lot of important potential collaboration between our fields, and we were talking about this before, and one of my real priorities, let's say, for this decade is to work on collaboration between journalism and other fields, including medicine, design, uh, computer science, data science, uh, and the like, um, because we're not going to solve this problem alone. So first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, hello, here we go. Uh, so I was a journalist for many years. Uh, I was a foreign correspondent, living a great life. I worked for the Wall Street Journal. For, uh, for a decade or more. Where? Uh, I was in Hong Kong, I was in Rome, uh, I was with a paper called the International Hill Tribune in Milan, um, thinking that, you know, like, that, that this was pretty much the, this was pretty much me or my version of, of me, right? <laughs> what I saw in the mirror. I like the hat. Uh, you know, thinking that I was a crusader for justice um, and uh, fighting the good fight, et cetera. Um, not thinking particularly much about the business model behind what I was doing. Um, and then I came back to the States in 2008, and I was sort of greeted with this kind of reality of the industry in which I worked. Wow. Okay, so this is just an oversimplification, um, but, you know, here we see essentially newspaper revenues, and then they just fall off a cliff. And then we see, of course, the rise of other revenues, such as Google and Facebook and, and players like that. Um, I'd say that there's more of more than just a correlation or an inverse correlation here. You know, that there is also some causation too. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out what's going on, why this wonderful life that I had been leading so for so long was now um, threatened and challenged, um, and that really sort of made me think uh, much more seriously about um, business models in journalism, but also really trying to understand the business model of news and the um, flow of news and information which has led to what I would call our present day media environment, right? Which is kind of an info swamp where you can have people who uh, proudly proclaim their ignorance by making their family dress up in t-shirts that say Pizzagate is not fake news uh, and going to a public place and being photographed like that. Um, and, you know, this is profoundly disturbing to me because this is such a polluted environment, right? I mean, this is essentially information toxicity, right? This is, uh, uh, and the fact that there can be a sort of debate in public or quasi-public that goes on about, you know, um, demonstrably false claims um, means, signals to me that we've got really, you know, much bigger problems that I, I wanted to sort of uh, address and figure out. So I have some approaches to that, which I'm going to get to at the end. But first, since there's a captive audience, I thought the doors were going to be locked here so they couldn't escape. Uh, I thought I'd take you on a little tour of just sort of some of the issues that I think about. And I think it's also just um, please, please interrupt me, stop me um, if this is obvious to you. Um, but one thing that I wanted to do was talk just a little bit about what has changed in our society, what has changed in our economy to lead us to a situation like this, okay? Um, because I kind of hold that the changing business model around news and information um, is a lot of what has led us to our current political environment. Um, the polarization that many of us feel is, I think, directly a result in part um, from the way in which money is transacted around news and media. So, um, of course, the current situation makes us nostalgic for this kind of situation. Many people in the audience here were far too young, never born. Not this man them. walked the earth, but some of us might know who this is. It was Walter Cronkite. He was famously thought to be the most trusted man in America uh, in the 1970s. And does anybody know how he would end his news broadcast? That's the way. That's the way it is, right? So if anybody tried to end a news broadcast right now saying that's the way it is, they would be laughed off 
the anchor spot, right? It's not a claim that anyone can make anymore. Um, and behind that is, I would posit um, uh, a different set of economic conditions that allowed Walter Cronkite to do that, um, but doesn't allow anyone to do it now or ever again. Um, I also want to say that I'm here also really to try to recruit you uh, for joint projects to help address this. So um, I just want to make sure that that's clear to everybody here that I really do want to, uh, I want. I hope that this can lead to some collaborative problem solving around some of these nasty issues. Um, okay, so <clears throat> when we talk about this information swamp we live in right now, um, I think it's important to remember that just over a hundred years ago, the the news and information environment was probably a lot similar to what it is today than today's news and information environment compared with, say, 1980. Okay? Um, and this is a newsstand in New York City crowded with newspapers. There were 500, roughly, newspapers published in New York City in 1910, including weeklies and dailies and morning papers and afternoon papers. Everybody was trying to clamor for your attention. Uh, you had papers that were in different languages. Uh, some of them were, you know, pure yellow journalism and racist. Some were, um, uh, um, you know, pro-labor papers, anti-labor papers, democratic papers, et cetera, et cetera. They were hawked to you by people who looked like this. <coughs> and in a way, this is kind of an analog version of the digital news environment we live in today, right? Where everybody is screaming for your attention and your attention is that scarce commodity. Um, so um, think about that and think for a moment about some of the conditions that allowed this to exist, okay? So here we have dense urban area. Um, so the physical distribution of news in a dense urban area is a lot easier, right? News has to come on, uh, you know, a format like this. Um, and so in a, a crowded environment like this, where people are divided by language, by class, um, by political affiliation and things like that, um, we have a very fragmented news and information environment. So, um, uh, you know, I once worked for a, a newspaper called The Forward, which I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of it, um, but the uh, it's uh, once upon a time was an old socialist Yiddish paper. And the, my editor used to joke that the way it would cover a car accident was that, you know, the greedy capitalist was speeding down the street and ran into the working man <laughs> who was trying to, you know, feed it as he was crossing the street, et cetera, et cetera. And so that kind of news coverage is very similar to the kind of news coverage, which now we, we feel we've grown accustomed to today um, and which is problematic, right? But there is an antecedent in American history for this kind of highly polarized, highly partisan news coverage. And that's because the marketplace for the news coverage was different then. When you have a fragmented audience marketplace, right, you are by definition going to get many different views, right? Many different kind of views because um, it's difficult to reach everybody with one flavor, and um, you're gonna be fighting for that niche in the audience and deliver the product that that niche wants, okay? So that's 1910 New York City, that's, uh, and don't forget that around the country in that time, met most major, all major cities and most even small cities had more than one daily newspaper, okay? more than one daily newspaper. And that's very significant because if you have a two newspaper town, right? Even if you've got 50,000 people in that town, two newspaper town, those newspapers are gonna be competing with each other <coughs> and trying to deliver what we would call today a diversified product, right? Something that is different, something that there's a reason to get uh, this paper instead of this paper, right? Trying to distinguish themselves in the marketplace. And if you've got a marketplace that can allow for many, many different players to survive, you're going to get a very differentiated news environment, news marketplace, right? Um, uh, and so most papers have these kinds of views, th th these kinds of environments. If anyone here is from Chicago, even, you know, recently, you would think of the Chicago Tribune being the anti-union paper and the Chicago Sun-Times being the pro-union paper, right? And that would be reflected in their editorial been blurred a little bit uh, lately, but that's, you know, 
that's how they would be identified. And those are the different markets within the metropolitan area of Chicago that they would try to cater to, okay? So then, of course, newspapers, and in an environment like this, it's very difficult to arrive at a collective understanding of what is truth, okay? Particularly when one newspaper is going to report on that traffic accident as being caused by the greedy capitalist, um, and the other one is going to report on it because, you know, the riffraff are now crossing the streets any which way, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> right? So um, in a crowded media environment, we're going to have this kind of, uh, this kind of truth becomes this very, what I would call it, contested terrain, okay? Um, then, of course, we have this great innovation uh, in the American media marketplace where television becomes fairly ubiquitous. Uh, and television presents this tremendous threat to newspapers because not because people spend so much time getting their news from television, but because television begins to suck the lifeblood of the newspaper business out, right? We've got a limited number of advertising dollars and a greater slice of those advertising dollars are now going to television, okay? It's an effective way to reach a mass geography. Um, and uh, as a result, all of these metropolitan areas in the United States, which could support two newspapers or three newspapers, Kansas City had five newspapers at one point, um, they have to consolidate, okay? And this consolidation means that a two newspaper town is going to become a one newspaper town. And that is a very significant difference, okay? And I wanna talk about that for a moment. So as the, it becomes clear that there are not enough advertising dollars to support uh, media markets with more than one newspaper, and those newspapers must consolidate. The papers that survive is not necessarily the best paper, but the biggest paper, and that's because of the economics of the newspaper business. So please bear with me here. Um, to run a newspaper, you have to put in so many huge fixed costs. Right? You have to buy printing presses, you have to uh, buy delivery trucks. This was not me, but I had this job when I was nine, uh, delivering the Middletown Press, which no longer exists. Um, uh, tremendous amount of upfront costs just to be a player in the market, right? So as we have this consolidation, right, the newspaper that's selling more copies and therefore has a lower unit cost has a tremendous advantage over any competitor that might be smaller. Does that make sense? Okay. drive to bring ice cream for everybody uh what flavor ice cream would you bring you can bring one flavor uh, all of them I, yeah I, I, well you can only bring I mean, one flavor mint, mint chocolate chip no 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 oh, you like vanilla. Ice cream for everybody. oh no vanilla. <laughs> vanilla right and why is vanilla the best ice cream flavor no it keeps well, it is, the, is it the least offensive ice cream Probably, flavor yeah. it is the least offensive ice cream flavor you are not going to piss anybody off by bringing vanilla you don't know me though okay <laughs> um if you brought mint chocolate chip yes you would piss people off um, so, so that becomes that that becomes a model for news generation too, right? If I now suddenly have to appeal to all of Chicago, not just the working class of Chicago, I am going to start delivering vanilla flavor news, right? Now, I'm just going to skip ahead here. Um, we call that we call that in journalism by a very lofty name. We call that objectivity. Okay, so objectivity, meaning that you approach the news from a dispassionate, uh, neutral stance, is not necessarily some inherent virtue of news coverage, okay? It is a consequence of a particular change in the marketplace of news, okay? And it, it, is, it is an economic imperative if suddenly you're a newspaper 
serving a consolidated news market with no competitors. Okay. If you now have monopoly control over an area, whether it's Kansas City, Chicago, Denver, whatever, right? You've got to appeal to everybody. The best way to do that is to not piss that person off. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Uh, why it's not always like that? So if you always want to have more audience, why are you forced to be objective to even- Excellent question, right? Okay, so this works not, so let's go back to that notion of fixed, so excellent question. Why wasn't this an economic imperative um, even before the consolidation of this period, right? Okay, so let's go back to the to the ice cream example. We asked Jonathan what ice cream flavor he was going to bring, and he only thought of himself, so he brought mint chocolate chip, of course. right? Because he only has to appeal to, he only has to, to please one customer, right? If he's got to please everybody, he's going to bring vanilla. However, if Jonathan were um, at the, uh, if Jonathan were at Baskin Robbins, he would not be ordering vanilla. So let me go back, and I'll, and I'll hopefully I'll have another example that will that will clarify this for a second. But don't forget that you, as a consumer, don't have choice anymore, right? There's not another flavor to which you can subscribe. You can only get this one. And there's an expression in journalism, the uh, the, the spit out your Cheerios story, that if somebody's reading the newspaper at breakfast and they see something that pisses them off so much that they spit their Cheerios out. And then they hurl the newspaper across the, the, the room and they say, I'm never going to subscribe to this newspaper again, et cetera, et cetera. You've pissed that person off. Now, don't forget, when you have a monopoly, what else do you get very quickly in business? Rich. Rich. You get rich. Exactly. You get stinking rich because you have no competition. Okay? This is the story of AT&T. This is the story of so many others, right? Now, if you get very rich and you happen to be the monopoly purveyor of news, you uh, you have tremendous power as well. Politicians line up for your endorsement from your sober, serious editorial board, right? Um, and everybody needs to get your approval and your blessing. In this context, in a democracy, we become very concerned when one entity has too much power, right? Objective journalism is wonderful ideological pepper spray to spray in the face of anyone who <laughs> accuses you of having too much power. Just the facts, ma'am. We practice objective journalism, right? Um, we're doing our job as professionals, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things work in concert with one another, okay, in a consolidated media marketplace. Um, uh, and this is also how we get to our notion of, tr of truth, right? We're excluding a lot of voices from the conversation in so doing. And we can get to Walter Cronkite from here, right? Because Walter Cronkite had two other competitors in the entire country, ABC and NBC, who produced products that were almost the same, right? Um, and that's why he could conclude a broadcast by saying, that's the way it is, right? My, word is, my the, word is true, right? My word is true because there's scarcity. It's a scarce news environment, okay? And again, as long as they're looking like they're doing it professionally and seriously, et cetera, et cetera, nobody's going to say that, you know, you are controlling the conversation in a way that is bad for our democracy, right? Where are you from? From Chile. From Chile, right? Okay, so most other marketplaces, media marketplaces, don't have this kind of, uh, let's call it monochromatic um, news experience, right? I mean, I spent a lot of time covering, you know, uh, Europe where – the you've got a variety of national newspapers, all of which have specific political terrain, <laughs> sometimes directly corresponding to political parties, right? But in the U.S., because of the way that the media market evolved into this single newspaper towns that controlled large metropolitan areas, you got this sort of objective journalism that was also uh, that was a consequence of this monopoly market. Okay. This notion of scarcity, of news scarcity, it's embedded in the brand of, of many news organizations, right? All the news that's fit to print, right? They feel that they can have a claim on truth uh, in an environment like that. And I just want to pause for a moment and just sort of examine what is going on. Because my point about all of this and, and where I want to enlist your help is in creating a new sort of economic model for this, which we'll get to in a moment. So the traditional business model had was, was basically putting uh, editorial content together with advertisement, 
packaging it together in a media entity, pushing it through scarce and costly distribution channels, those newspaper trucks, those delivery boys and things like that, with consumers on the other end. Okay, so if you're an advertiser needing to sell product, right, you got to start here, you got to go to the, to, the, to the media entity, they package your advertisement together with, with media content, um, distribute it through uh, newspaper trucks or something like that, and consumers on the, are on the other end. Now, here we are in 2020, this model no longer works uh, the way it once did, but, but basically, this is what we're talking about. You've got editorial content, ads, packaged through a media through a media entity which was delivered on my doorstep this morning by a truck okay um, now what's also important to know about this is um, you know I always thought that the, the, the normal length for a news story was 600 700 words right um, and I thought that Moses had come down from Mount Sinai and said that your news articles will be six or seven hundred words right um, but no News articles were that length, traditionally that length, because that's how much text you could fit on a page and still have room for advertising. Right. Okay, so everything that we get in terms of our news and information diet is a consequence of an economic model, right? Think of this as an economic unit, right, that is delivering some kind of value to both the, the reader and to the advertiser. And the content itself has to fit into that shape. Same thing for TV, right? How long is a sitcom? 22 minutes. 24 minutes. 22 minutes, right? 22 minutes of sitcom. Yeah. Packaged together is what? 30. 30 minutes, right? Because in a linear viewing model where we have to tell everybody what time the show starts before we had DVRs, before we had streaming and stuff like that, it's easier to say sit down at 8 at eight o'clock than sit down at 8.11 or 8.14 or something like that. Sit down at 8 o'clock and we're going to give you this package, which is 22 minutes long, which is really an excuse to put in three commercial breaks into that, right? As a result, the narrative structure of a sitcom is very similar, right? They start with some sort of confusion and then they get to wrap up some of those loose ends by the end and in 22 minutes we have our story, right? And TV writers who have worked on many different shows will tell you that like, you know, yeah, that's what we did, right? Now that we no longer distribute television like that, the length of shows is going all crazy, right? Some episodes will be 47 minutes because they're on Netflix and then the next episode will be, you know, uh, an hour and six minutes, et cetera. They're no longer constrained by that, right? So everything, all of our content is a consequence of the economic model that's distributing it. And that's particularly important when we're talking about news and information, which informs our political sphere and so many other things. Um, okay, so um, we talked about how people got really rich. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah. Right. This is Kay Graham. She was the publisher of the Washington Post. Anybody know who this is? No one ever. Nobody ever knows who this is. This is Walter Annenberg. Uh, here pictured just after he was named the ambassador to the court of St. James by Richard Nixon. Um, he was named ambassador to the court of St. James because he was so damn rich and powerful because he owned the Philadelphia newspaper market, basically, and many other chains across Pennsylvania. That gave him a lot of power. Um, uh, and he parlayed that power into an ambassadorship um, and then gave away lots of money to USC. Um, uh, okay, so that's the environment from essentially 1950 to 2000, if we're gonna kind of arbitrarily give a start and an end point to it, right? And that's the environment that I sort of grew up with that some other people I can tell here grew up with. Um, and some other people here might say, what the hell are you talking about? Um, uh, because you're too damn young. Um, uh, however, again, our notion about what is proper and correct, et cetera, was informed by a particular moment in which a particular economic model existed, right? A particular economic model for delivering news and information, which made news and information scarce, which meant those who could, pr who could produce it <coughs> got really rich because they had near monopoly or total monopoly power, okay? And as a result, we got something that we thought was very professional uh, in terms of the, the way that it was produced. To a large extent, that was true. Um, it also had its flaws. Um, and I just want to sort of talk just very quickly um, before you guys fall asleep. I know it's right before lunch. Um, just to remind people sort of what has changed in this model, there's two big changes. Obviously, distribution costs is incredibly costly. Um, uh, investments that you would have to make in delivering a physical product to people's doorsteps every morning, 
which meant that no, not many players could get into that game because it was so expensive. That all of a sudden zero, right? The other huge change is that transaction costs have dropped. And by transaction costs, I mean the costs of, uh, of right. putting together something really complicated, right? It used to be that like, if you're gonna make something as complicated as an automobile, you need a firm. There's a guy named uh, Ronald Coase. He, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics. He had a book called The Theory of the Firm, um, which is basically like, if you wanna do something complicated, right? The only way to bring transaction costs down is to have a large corporation so that when you buy a, a, a lug or a nut or a fender or something like that, you're buying thousands and thousands of them so that the cost of tr the transaction cost involved in acquiring that is low. Now, of course, transaction, transaction costs are very, very low, right? What did Wikipedia replace? Encyclopedia, right? And somewhere in London, there's the office of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is a big, costly building filled with experts who write articles and stuff like that. And these guys are like, yeah, we, we got that. And, and ours is actually more up to date because every time something changes, we can update it, right? Transaction costs have gone down. That means, of course, that media entities, which used to assemble a complicated product, not unlike a, uh, a, uh, an automobile because it's got so many different parts, right? They needed huge investments in, in buildings like this, which is still downtown in Los Angeles. Of course, the LA Times no longer resides in that building because it's too costly and their business model can no longer support it. They've moved to El Segundo. So all of those things have switched, right? And I just wanna mention here to try to, um, uh, try just to bring a little context to this. I was sitting here from uh, my office at the Wall Street Journal, um, the bureau chief watching the economy meltdown in 2008 and 2009, watching my own industry uh, go up in flames and trying to understand what was going on. One of the great things about my perch at that time was that I got to run the, cover, the Wall Street Journal's coverage of the music industry, the TV industry, and the movie industry, each of which were experiencing their own cataclysm um, as these technological shifts enter their industry. So the music industry used to be based on this. Uh, artists would get rich by selling CDs to you know, people like us. Um, and then of course, <clears throat> um, so not unlike a physical product like a newspaper that was sold, now when was the last time someone bought a CD? Raise your hand. I think guys are. I was at a show. Yeah, and he brings mint chocolate chip too to the party, right? Yeah. <laughs> I went to a show. I wanted to help out. Those of us don't like lossy, lossy compression. But okay. Yes. Thank you. There we go. Okay. So there are, you know, and some people buy vinyl and stuff like that. Shows. However, the, the way in which most Who of likes? us consume music now is through digital streaming, right? There is no <laughs> scarcity to that. There is no limits on that. Therefore, it's very difficult to make any money on streaming. It used to be that the music business bands would go on tour to promote the sale of their album. That business, after nearly dying, has essentially been switched. Now, bands put out an album to promote a tour. And the reason why they do that is because there's scarcity. There's a limited number of seats in this auditorium, which means that we can put a high price on those seats, right? And so the economics of, of the music business has shifted. I mentioned that because the economics of all content-related businesses have shifted, right? And they have consequences as they have shifted. So, uh, da, 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 okay. So to your question, <coughs> sorry, Andres. Andres. Okay. So, um, uh, why, if, <clears throat> why didn't media entities, uh, news, let's call them uh, news outlets, try to practice that uh, that less offensive, um, objective journalism when there were more competitors? Right. Let's just look at this. If anybody knows this show, it was very popular in the 1950s. I um, do. It is pretty much the whitest show you could ever come up with, right? It's about Beaver. He would get into all kinds of mischief. He would stain the carpet and not tell his mom, and then his mom would find out, you know, um, pretty much the vanilla ice cream of media content. Very. Okay? Now, this was released in a moment when there were consumers had three options, ABC, NBC, or CBS, right? Very limited competition. The smart economic choice in that environment is to try to appeal to everybody, okay? To have inoffensive content, much like objective journalism is inoffensive in nature. That's vanilla. That is vanilla, okay? In every, in more ways than one, okay? Now, when we start distributing media on a cable dial where we have 700 channels and we have four house and garden TV networks that we didn't even know existed, right? The, the sensible... <laughs> 
economic decision is to find a niche and overserve that niche. And that's when we get successful uh, shows like this, where my high school chem teacher runs a meth lab, right? That is basically trying to overserve one particular niche, right? <laughs> my mother's not gonna like this show very much, um, but there is gonna be a market for this show that it's going to do well in, right? This is a fragmented media marketplace and this is an aggregated media marketplace, right? So let's take this same concept, right? And, and put it into the context of news and information, right? So to be successful in a fragmented media marketplace, in a fragmented news media marketplace, you kind of have to pick your lane. Um, and this is, there's a lot of problem, problems with this uh, diagram, but it basically tries to place each uh, major news outlet on some sort of spectrum and say, you know, they're serving a different audience. So let me give you one other example. CNN started in June of 1980. CNN was a disruptive uh, approach to news because it offered new TV news all the time, replacing what we would call appointment viewing when people had to sit, sit down at 6 p.m. to watch the news, right? You had to wait to get your news at 6 p.m. when Walter Cronkite would come on. Um, so CNN thought if we can get people to watch 20 minutes of news at 4 p.m., that's 20 minutes of news they won't be watching at 6 p.m. Right, and we'll just start to steal that market. Very successful. The network news, evening network news programs hit their all time audience peak the month that CNN debuted, and then they've been going down ever since. Um, then other people thought, well, CNN, this is a great business model. We should jump into this game as well. So then came Fox News, right? And Fox News thought, okay, if CNN wants to give people this straight news and their innovation is delivering it to them at any time of day, we think that there's an underserved market of people who don't feel represented by that news because they feel it's too liberal, okay? And we're gonna own this particular segment of the marketplace. Then MSNBC comes on, not as an antidote to Fox or anything like that, but as a third player in this crowd, increasingly crowded 24 hour news market. And MSNBC in its first years is a disaster. Its, its ratings are on the floor nothing is happening, um, they don't know how to appeal to an audience. Then finally they realize that if Fox is over here and CNN is in the middle, that there's this huge space on the left that they can occupy. And so they essentially rebrand themselves as a liberal, as a liberal leaning, um, somewhat more partisan 24 hour news network and their fortunes start to rise, okay? It's an economic imperative for MSNBC to carve out its own niche in an increasingly crowded marketplace. Um, there are some good things about this um, uh, more, let's say, uh, crowded news marketplace. This used to be how the news agenda was set, right? Um, and I've been in many meetings like this where there's not a lot of diversity around the table and people there are deciding the news agenda for the nation of what goes on the front page, what's the most important story, et cetera. They do that because they have expertise, they have years of experience and so forth, and that's important. But it also misses a lot of stuff because they're not aware of their own biases and their own perspectives, right? Here is a democratized news agenda setting where people essentially get to vote on stories uh, through likes, through you know, um, different uh, uh, mechanisms that we have available to us on social media to tell the world what we think is important, okay? Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely some good in that. I'll skip over this uh, because I don't, I don't want to bore you. Okay, so once again, this is our traditional business model for, for media. Um, and now this is being replaced uh, by a completely new model. And my point is that the, um, the way we monetize news content determines the kind of content that we get. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this slide. Okay, so this is basically what happens. This is all the ad tech that exists <coughs> between when you click on a link and when that page is served up to you, right? And this is important to understand because this is, the, this is what is driving the monetization of, of media content. Okay, online, digital media content. So Andres, when he clicks on something, they're gonna think, you know, uh, um, th they're gonna know certain things about him, that he, you know, wears glasses, that he lives in Los Angeles, 
uh, that he probably has, you know, um, higher education and, and so on and so forth. And there's a huge demographic profile that they have assembled about him every from his browser, from all the cookies and everything else. And so every time he clicks, his information is suddenly put out to bid. And there are a whole bunch of advertisers who then through this technology say, I'm looking for people that fit this profile. And they say, well, we've got one who's just clicked on something. If you want to bid on him, you can, you can have him and whoever whichever advertiser marketer puts out the highest bid gets to serve the ad that, that goes onto the page that Andres has just clicked on, right? And that all happens in, you know, a few it's all seconds, instantaneous. right? Yeah. Um, that not is hardly, a, by the way. What's that? Not hardly. Not, not yeah, hardly. I mean, the idea is instantaneous, <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you ever try browsing, like, like without ads? Like, like it's, it's so much faster. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like load times on pages that have, I mean, I, I, there's, um, I mean, I, you know, every once in a while this will pop out sure. where you'll see something where it's like, okay, then the, actually there was a visualization recently that came out of like the number of redirects for one click and that you can't do that for free. Right. You know, so if you ever have a browse without all that. Yeah, and there's nothing that, that says that this architecture here is efficient. You can see how crowded it is. Yeah. And this is outdated, too, because every couple of months, this guy does a new Loomis game. Also, there's tremendous consolidation in this space. Is there, I mean, presumably there's got to be, uh, you know, eventually you, you, you create the universe if you want to say how anything gets made. So, like, there's, there should be, like, a there's a point here at which, like, for example, the, mm, the ad itself isn't, the creation of the ad itself is not, is that not on here? No, this is simply, so here we've got... Um, and also the creation of the news. Right. So the creation of the so so the creation of the news is what I'll talk about. The creation of the ad is partly based <coughs> on their ability to uh, A/B test so many of their ads with so many people in real time, et cetera, okay. et cetera. Right. And, and Facebook has developed tools that allow you to automate a lot of that too. But we assume the business of ad making goes on somewhere else. Yes. The, the literal. Right. 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 The the the, uh, the creation of this kind of plumbing happens, you know, not far from here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a publicly traded ad tech firm called, gosh, it starts with an R. I visited their offices. It's, it's not far from here. There's a bunch of other places. The Google folks, you know, around here do a lot of this too. Um, but in, but let me just make a different point about what's created. Okay, so um, again, the monetization structure is going to determine the content that we get. So um, Google realized that there was a tremendous opportunity to create ad units around what people were searching for, right? And so if you're searching for, I think I want to buy a new car, right? Google's going to be like, whoa, yeah. gold mine. Let's serve up some car ads to this person who essentially just identified themselves as being in the market to buy a new car, right? Or what kind of diapers are the best, mm -hmm. right? You know, you're going to be getting Pampers ads for the next, you know, 10 years. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, so... Um, and that's because that uh, Google turned the search term into a transaction space, right? There was a company in Santa Monica, there still is a company uh, in Santa Monica um, called Demand Media, publicly traded. Their early model was, oh, we can figure out what people are searching for frequently, and therefore we can create content that better fits those search terms, right? So if people are searching for, you know, what is the most environmentally friendly car, and that's a fairly frequent search term on Google, they simply would spend $20, $40 to produce a very crappy article uh, that would have a lot of the keywords that would correspond to that search. And that meant that their article was going to get a lot of traffic, and they could serve ads next to that article. That's called search bait, right? And so basically all they were doing is saying, well, you created this monetization engine, we're simply feeding the content into it that's going to be optimized for it, right? How many people have found something like this at the bottom of their web page, right? Okay, oh. same thing, right? This is clickbait because here, right, we're basically saying, hey, if we can get people to click on it, we have sold an ad, right? So how many people have clicked on one of these things and been terribly disappointed by what they found? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, right. because they don't care. Yeah. There's no relationship that they have with you. There's no brand here, et cetera. All they're doing is putting out um, captivating headlines, right? Because as soon as you click on it, money changes hands. And so their goal is just to get you to do that. And so these were, there were two, this is Taboola. There was another firm called Outbrain. Both were from Israel. They since combined. Um, uh, but they were basically, they'd, they'd go to ESPN and be like, we're gonna rent the bottom of every article page you have. We're gonna put this there. 
will spend you know, 10 cents uh, to rent that space, but will be able to generate 12 cents in advertising sales because you, know, you eventually clicked on that once or twice, right? Um, so, so this is clickbait, right? So again, this is just people sort of saying, okay, now you've changed the economic model, we'll change the kind of content we, uh, um, we produce. This is what your media, news media business model looks like now and why things are so problematic, okay? Um, all publications, New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine, Sports Insert, everything are over here. Attention is the scarce commodity. Facebook controls that, and Facebook is the one that matches the ads with the consumers. These guys have been what we would call commoditized, right? They are simply producing raw material that Facebook then monetizes, okay? So their economic position has been tremendously damaged in this relationship, okay? Remember, it used to be that if you wanted to reach, uh, you know, wealthy, smart people on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, you had to advertise in the New York Times, right? That was your access to those people. If you wanted to reach, you know, uh, shoppers in Los Angeles, you had to go through here, right? Now it's Facebook that controls that relationship and figures out who's in Los Angeles, what their, um, what their desires are, what their um, profile is, et cetera. And Facebook is matching those users with the ads and therefore the economic value is flowing to Facebook. But For, if I may interrupt, yes. have it, instead you used the word damaged, or reduce their the publications abilities, but isn't this actually resulting opportunity for them to focus? No. So don't forget what is in your newsfeed, right? A whole bunch of stuff, yeah. right? Some of it is stuff that you have opted for. Other stuff is stuff that's been put there for you, right? right? Who's making that decision? Uh, and, and in that environment, so let's say you're looking at the easiest thing is to think about this. Let's see if I have an example of it. Uh, um, if you're looking at it on a uh, on a, a laptop screen, okay? So Facebook is placing ads next to the content that it's scrolling by, and they're capturing that value. And they're also often being the, the ones who match the ad that appears on the page should you click on something, because they know everything about it, right? And every time we do a like or sad button or whatever, we're giving them more marketing information to help sort us. That I understand, but yeah. what I'm saying is that now the publication no longer have to deal with all that peripheral activity. They can have the opportunity. So, so another thing is that who owns the customer now? Well, yeah. Facebook owns the customer, yeah. right? And you now as, so let's let's say, okay, so here's the example. And there's, there's a site called uglyfamilyphotos.com. <laughs> uh, it is exactly as it sounds, right? Can be entertaining for 30 to 45 seconds. Um, let's say that you uh, are reading the New York Times <clears throat> and some an advertiser wants to reach New York Times readers or people who match a profile of New York Times readers who let's just be elitist here who are you know educated and and smart and care about certain issues okay reaching them on the New York Times page is expensive but we can track that person we know the next place that they go is someplace really cheap uglyfamilyphotos.com okay and I can reach you there, right? And I have essentially stolen the economic value from, right, from the New York Times. Right. Um, okay, I'm getting to the end, I promise. Um, uh, I'm getting to the part where I'm gonna ask you for help, okay? Um, so uh, <clears throat> um, one thing about this is that on social media, the life, style of, the life cycle of content is click, share, click, share. You click on something and you share it, other people see it, they click on it and share it, et cetera. If somebody doesn't click or doesn't share, the life cycle of that content eventually ends, right? Okay, so people have figured out that that's a business model. And also then a bunch of sociologists look at this and they say, well, what prompts people to click and share and click and share? Well, people click more frequently on content that has high emotional content, right? And people share more frequently on content that is positive. So. My uh, football team was in the Super Bowl, high emotional content. I might click on that. My football team lost. I'm not going to share on it, share it, right? My football team won. I'm going to share it. So then a bunch of media entities are like, well, okay, duh. We're just going to produce a lot of content that is, um, you know, 
high, um, uh, <clears throat> high emotional content and positive, and people are going to click and share and click and share. The, that business is called Upworthy. They have you know 40 billion, 40 whatever gazillion unique views a, a month, um, and all they do is sort of reproduce that model, right? So none of this gets us to the sort of thoughtful news coverage uh, that we have. Okay, so. Um, so, uh, so here we are, and here's where I want to kind of ask for help because um, I've been trying to sort of uh, address this problem in, in many different ways, um, and uh, I've been sort of experimenting with something uh, that um, addresses that this that involves data. I'm sure a lot of you have seen fantastic examples of data journalism. Um, I'll even skip over this. Jonah Beretti, who died, who created BuzzFeed, he's diagnosed this problem very well. Um, but let me let me move along here. So. Data journalism, what is data journalism, right? Our basic conception of data journalism is that we use data to tell our stories, to find out um, the, you know, the, the sort of essence or nuance of an issue, um, and that can lead to tremendous insights. Uh, former colleagues of mine at the Wall Street Journal won the Pulitzer Prize because they, they were able to get their hands on a huge um, database of Medicare expenditures, and then they were able from that to figure out who was committing fraud, right? And this is kind of the, the insight that emerged, right? You can just see it in these two different graphs, right? One hospital was able to completely game the system and charge people you know, much higher uh, Medicare um, fees than the other one. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is the uh, Christine Blasey Ford testimony before the Senate and Kavanaugh. Each time they answered a question and each time they didn't answer a question, this simple visualization tells you a lot about that testimony. Okay, so these are all interesting, I think, innovative ways of approaching data journalism, but they don't solve my problem, okay? Um, they really don't so solve my problem at all. Um, and because my problem has to do with um, how do we get, uh, um, how do we bring costs down for this? Let me just show you one other, well, I'll just skip that one. But, um, there are some others that I think um, get a little closer to this. So, for example, um, well, here's a beautiful one that uh, Bloomberg did, which looks at how uh, land use in America, okay? And once you actually break down and do different visualizations of land use in America, you realize that the largest portion of our uh, land in the, in the uh, lower 48 states is devoted basically toward beef. Okay, and I looked at this, and I have ended up stop. I stopped eating beef, um, uh, and it's really smart and everything else. Now, <clears throat> this takes tremendous amount of effort, um, and uh, to tell, I think, an important story. But this, I would say, is the journalistic equivalent of milk in your fridge. Okay, it's getting stale, right? You've taken a static data set like these old Medicare records and stuff like that, and found out places where there's fraud or you've taken sort of a map of land use in the United States and you put that into a powerful visualization. But with each passing day, this becomes less relevant and less accurate, okay? And so I think that there are much smarter um, uses of data in journalism that allow us to solve one of the big crucial problems, which is cost of production, right? Um, if anybody was in the CBS news studios in you know the 90s or something like that, I mean, it, it was, very expensive, very well appointed offices, et cetera, right? Because they they generated so much revenue, they could spend a whole amount uh, of money on uh, on producing their news. Those uh, those days are gone. So here's another version, and I think this is really interesting. But I'm going to show it to you. You need to think this is like I could do this with my left hand before lunch. Okay, this is 538, which is a data journalism website, sort of. Um, and they basically said, okay, so each month we're writing, and I, as the Wall Street Journal, I've written this story. Unemployment numbers come out. It's a big, important number, right? It says something about the economy. We want to report on it. But every month, I'm writing pretty much a version of the same damn story. So they're like, hey, remember the Mad Lib game that we all played growing up? Um, well, the numbers are going to change, but a lot of the significance of the story sort of remains the same. So we're going to create a story template that's automatically going to be updated with the relevant numbers and you know, what they can do for relevant context around that, right? So they've created one post that now can live for a long time and has continuing relevance. 
very basic. I'm sure that a lot of people in this room can do this for that, and this is not challenging to you. Mail merge. So, so however, this is, I mentioned this because I feel that this is why we need to collaborate because this is, this in my world is considered innovative, right? In your <laughs> world, this is considered, uh, you know, nobody's gonna get accepted to a, to a PhD program putting this out as their, uh, as their work. This one I thought was a little more interesting um, partly because, again, it does have that shelf life. This is a product that ProPublica um, designed. ProPublica, again, Pulitzer Prize winning nonprofit news site. They basically figured out a way to scrape all of the um, disclosures that doctors have to make about money they have taken from ph pharmaceutical companies. So I immediately started plugging in names of people I went to college with and said, like, is this person on the take? And I knew he was on the take. <laughs> um, yeah, he was in my class in college. Um, uh, and here he is getting, you know, taking $152,000 a year from pharmaceutical companies, and I can see exactly which ones and stuff like that, right? So there's, so here we can see there's, there's greater utility to this, right? There's a consumer component to this. And also what I like about this is we've got one massive data set, but it becomes a sort of chart your own adventure for the user, right? And so the relevance becomes um, uh, much more nuanced, um, and it can be put to use in many different ways, right? Um, and this aggregate data can also tell a story about the influence of pharmaceutical money in in medical care and things like that. Right. So I yeah, you mentioned like the people in this room doing things before lunch or whatever. Yeah. One of the things that like for example you could get a PhD doing is like you know generative text and you know, John knows plenty about that. But that's like and I I'm really into sports and so one of the things that's happening you know you mentioned your little sort of mm -hmm. Mad Lib article. Um, they're not quite Mad Libs, but like AP, you know, they're called gamers, recaps. Yeah. yeah. So those can be written by computers now. Sure. And they so, all, right, journalistic. Right. So yeah. all of that's actually bad for journalism, isn't it? Because it's no. putting journalists out of jobs. I no? disagree. Okay. I disagree. Well, I was, well, I was curious. No, no, and that's an excellent that. point, right? Yeah. So, so, um, so sports journalists, right? We have a lot of people who come to Annenberg because they love sports. They want to be sports journalists, et cetera. But one of the classic products that a sports journalist will produce is the game recap, right? Well, People have designed computer programs that can look at the box score of a baseball game and can basically generate a serviceable story, okay? Uh, a serviceable story for that game, and they can do a version for the home team and a version for the away team, right? Um, and I like that a lot because that is not, nobody, that, that's not the best use of the journalist's time, okay? okay? And that increased the cost of the production of journalism. So for people who say, I don't like that because it's putting journalists out of work, I think that's a little bit of the Luddite argument saying, we don't want this new textile technology because it's gonna put us out of work, right? I wanna push the field forward and it is not going to go forward if people have to be engaged in doing tasks that can, machines can do better when those same people can be put to use, looking into steroid use or brain injury or other big stuff. That assumes the audience wants that versus just the gamer, right? Right. Uh, I mean, you're 100% you're no, right. No, the technology I, I, so, moves ahead regardless. Absolutely. Well, so. technology moves ahead. And I think that we have to, uh, but I think that there's, the use of that technology can go hand in hand with improving the um, the outcomes of journalism for the public and for the journalists themselves. And so let me, let me get into that. Um, okay, so I've been working on a project here uh, called Crosstown, and the, the the origin of Crosstown. Does anybody know a guy who was at the the Integrated Media Systems Center? He's now at Apple. Uh, or Demiuric. Does anybody remember him? No. Okay. Um, he's now designing the Apple Car project and stuff like that. So um, some a chunk of money fell from the sky uh, into Annenberg's hands from Wallace Annenberg, daughter of Walter Annenberg. Um, and she said, I want you to go work on news innovation and I want you to do it with these people in the computer science department, Cyrus Shahabi and, and his group, et cetera. And so then my boss came to me and said, you're gonna be our representative for this. These are the people you're working with. I said, great, it's like a shotgun marriage. We didn't know each other. Now all of a sudden we're linked together because we have a grant. So I sat down with Orr and he said, and I said, what are the kind of things that you do? He says, oh, well, we work with large data sets and media assets and things like that. I said, give me an example. I said, okay, well, um, Los Angeles Metro, right? The Metropolitan Transportation Authority um, has all of this data coming in because every time you drive over one of the circles in the freeway, that sends a couple of data points to the, to the base about how fast you were going, the time in which your car hit it and everything else. And it's a lot of data and it's too complicated for them to manage. So we had a contract with them to manage and curate their data 
um, for five years now. And I said, that's really interesting. So you've got five years worth of LA traffic data. They said, yeah. And I said, well, what kind of questions does LA Metro ask you about? <laughs> and he said, well, they haven't asked us any questions. <laughs> and I thought, you know, my journalist uh, antenna went off and I was like, okay, this is gonna be the beginning of a long and beautiful friendship. Because if anybody has had the misfortune of watching local news, TV news in LA, what is the one issue that they report on more than anything else? Traffic. traffic, right? They even put helicopters in the sky to report on traffic. And here we are sitting on five years of traffic data about every freeway and major roadway in LA. And I'm thinking I can use that data to tell stories, right? And I can use that data to tell stories in a way that I don't think has been done before. So we started this thing called Crosstown, which was essentially trying to take that idea. Our idea was, okay, we are only going to work with recurring data sets not data sets that we've collected and that are gonna sit there and eventually go stale, but data sets that are always gonna be replenished with fresh data so we can tell a story over time. And we're gonna divide those data, those data sets are gonna have some type of geographical component, uh, like a freeway or crime or things like that. And then because those data sets cover a wide geography and people in LA don't necessarily think of themselves as residents of LA County, right? But residents of Culver City or Alhambra or the West Side or Boyle Heights or whatever, right? We're gonna chop those data sets up so that they don't tell just one story, but tell hundreds of stories depending on where you are, right? So if I were to ask you, you know, what is the slowest freeway in LA? Does anybody have an answer for that? 405. 110? No. I don't say 110. Okay, you're all wrong. Um, the slowest freeway in LA is the Nine. five going out of, uh, let's see here, Whoops. Uh, the five going south from downtown in the evening, okay? And I, and I can tell you that because we made a whole list of all of them, right? And so this is the way of, of taking one data set and telling multiple stories out of it, right? Now, this isn't the best storytelling convention I'm showing you here, um, but uh, this is actually kind of classic water cooler conversation for Los Angeles, right? Do you know that I'm on the slowest freeway in LA? Um, or something like that, you know? I thought I was on the slowest freeway. No, you're not, I am. Um, this really helps sort of inform people about their environment because again, we, we understand this problem, but we understand it from the perspective of our windshield, okay? Um, and now we're able to tell this chart this over time. Okay, which is the freeway that has declined in speed the most, right? Which is the freeway that has gotten faster? There are a few. Um, so on and so forth, which is the freeway that has the most accidents, things like that, right? This is basic, basic stuff. We're essentially counting rows of data, but we're, to your point, we're sort of doing a lot of what previously would have taken tremendous amounts of effort on the part of journalists to sort of try to figure this out. And I believe that there's also a public utility in doing this kind of work. Several years ago, people in Los Angeles voted with an overwhelming majority to tax themselves more to raise money for more transportation projects. It was called Measure M, right? It's gonna raise over $30 billion over the next 10 years or something like that for, for transportation infrastructure. Now, who gets to decide where that money is spent? Not the people who voted on it, right? County government. Uh, county government and LA Metro. It's the, the conversation takes place up here. Once the public has access to data in which they can quantify, we see the problem as being most severe here. And here's the data to prove it it is much easier for the public to be involved in that conversation about where that money gets spent, okay? So those are the kind of things that we're trying to, we're, we're trying to do. And we're using that data in a way to, um, uh, we're trying to be as innovative as we can with this data. A lot of what we've done is we've worked on, on um, uh, we've worked on crime data, and let me just show you. Um, with, yes, go ahead. Is the data itself shareable? to oh, yes. like within USC, like we can get the raw numbers that you use? Totally, well, this is, this is what, I, what we're doing here is I'd say we're taking publicly available data and making it publicly accessible. Oh, great. Okay, so um, we collected 10 years of crime data, and this is again the rule of live demos that my map does not seem to be loading now here, right? Um, Thank you, uh, we, we collect data from now 11 different law enforcement agencies. Um, we've uh, across Los Angeles County, there are 47, so we have a ways to go. Um, we've then, uh, you guys have a better term for this, but we've normalized this data. That is, the Sierra Madre Police Department reports um, break-in of a vehicle in one way. The Santa Monica Police Department reports it in another way. We've put that into the same category so that we can get apples-to-apples -apples comparisons in different areas. Um, and then, uh, this map still has not fully loaded, um, but then we put this into... Uh, 
um, <clears throat> something that allows us to look at each LA neighborhood and many places across Los Angeles. Great, I'm not working here. Um, uh, so that you can see the rank of your neighborhood in terms of crime and where you are um, and how your neighborhood ranks to others. Believe me, this usually works, except for the time when I show it in public. Um, <laughs> Welcome uh, to Wi-Fi at ISI. Be <laughs> <laughs> well, before we had a lot of issues in terms of even just getting this thing uh, uh, hooked up. But um, downtown is the highest crime rate. Um, where I live, I just discovered, has the second highest property crime rate, um, Fairfax, um, so on and so forth. So crime, like, we're, we, we do crime the way that Jeff Bezos sold books. Um, Jeff Bezos initially, you know, uh, a lot of people when Amazon started, um, they thought, oh, wow, it's a bookstore. It's an online bookstore. Um, how clever. He's selling books online. And Jeff Bezos was thinking, no, I'm not. I'm <laughs> testing whether I can sell stuff online. And I'm just, I'm starting with books because books don't come in the wrong size or the wrong color. You don't have to send them back because they don't fit, right? It's a good test product. If I can sell books, I can show that I can manage inventory and deliver it to people. And if I can do that, I can sell everything, right? So we started with crime data because crime data changes every day. People can understand it. Um, it's a topic in the news and stuff like that. Um, but crime data is really just the books that we want to, like, our, our test, right? And there's so much other data that we can use to tell stories about our environment, such as beat data from, uh, you know, from freeways. Um, there's a guy at the Social Sciences uh, Institute, Yao Yi Chang, if anybody knows him. He created a, a machine learning model that, um, uh, let's see, where is it here? Um, that... Um, estimates what the PM 2.5 levels in the air are at any point on the Cartesian plane of Los Angeles County. Um, and so right now there's a government agency, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which sends out periodic alerts about air quality. Um, the quality of those alerts reminds me of the Bush era terrorism warnings. <laughs> like it's orange. <laughs> and, like, what do I do? Do I go to the airport because I have a flight, or do I stay home and cower under my bed? You know, I no, don't it's know. Orange. It's orange. It's yeah. orange. What's going on, right? Um, so this gives us very accurate stuff. This is uh, where my office is and stuff like that. Um, and so you can plug in an address and get the PM 2.5 level of where you are. But then we can we can craft this with a user interface and everything else to help people really understand things, particularly particular groups, right? Asthma sufferers, others, um, and uh, allow them to make informed decisions. Or like, you know, my daughter has soccer practice at this field at 5 p.m. What is the air quality at 5 p.m.? Is it better at 3 p.m.? You know, I usually go for a run uh, at this hour along this route. What am I exposing myself to? My point is that we're, we're dealing with a little, little bit of what I would call the horse-drawn carriage problem, right? Um, a lot of us are used to thinking of news coming in this format, right? And now we're realizing that news can simply, I mean, this can, this number itself is a news product, right? And we're not quite sure what to call it, and we're not sure, um, so the way that horseless carriage, I meant that that's what people initially called the automobile, because they didn't know what an automobile was, and they just said it's a horse-drawn carriage, right? So we're trying to sort of reinvent the way that news can be packaged, and the way that it can be made relevant to individual specific identifiable audiences. And we're trying to use data as a way to harness, we're trying to harness data in order to deliver the same kind of quality news and information from a verified source that people were once accustomed to getting from the likes of Walter Cronkite and others like that. And if we can do that, I think that we can change sort of the, we can create a new sort of business model around news. Last thing I'll leave you with. So we got a big grant from Google to, to sort of experiment with this. And what we pitched to them was, um, we, are going to, uh, um, we are going to deliver a newsletter, where was my, uh, here it is, uh, a newsletter to every neighborhood in Los Angeles, okay? Um, and uh, each, and that's 110 neighborhoods, city of Los Angeles. Every neighborhood can get its own newsletter uh, with news and information specific to that neighborhood that helps rank that neighborhood so the people in Echo Park can see that um, they've got it better than the people in Silver Lake and stuff like that, um, you know, in terms of housing prices or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we can start to sort of quantify all these things. But what we can do is create 
I don't want to say the equivalent of 110 local newspapers because by defining it as a newspaper, I'm, I think I'm sort of limiting what it can do, but it's 110 distinct news products, right? That we can create and we can create them at scale. So it costs us the same amount to create two as it does to create 110. And hopefully that can catch on and we can turn that into some type of business. So, so doesn't next door do a lot of that already? Oh God. I say, say, this all sounds like patch, but actually okay. gonna work. So so two things. <laughs> patch and next door, right? So here's two models, right? Just patch was basically um, the newspaper model. Newspaper model, uh, sort of a community newspaper online. And they tried to roll these things out like McDonald's franchises. So you would have a patch in your neighborhood. Um, and there would be a local journalist that would be underpaid, who would be churning out lots of articles and also posting community events and things like that, right? And the problem is that when you're trying to do something like that, what makes a good local blog is someone who, um, the good local blog is more like your local neighborhood coffee shop, not like your McDonald's, okay? McDonald's is the same everywhere, um, but a good local paper has something to say about that neighborhood. So that was not a scalable model. Next door, is is integral to what we're trying to do, but next door is user generated content, and often it's sure that's shorthand for uh, <laughs> racial profiling. Okay. Yes. Um, and um, what next door and a few other apps, Citizen and Neighbor, do is what they do is they give you crime without content. Yes. This terrible incident happened, therefore we are surrounded by crime. Right. What we're trying to do is say actually. Violent crimes in your neighborhood have, dec have declined seven percent last year and six percent the year before that. Right, and we're trying to give them data. So what I see us as doing is pr providing something that people would then discuss on next door. Right now, people don't always take kindly to being confronted with the facts, um, <laughs> especially on next door. Especially on next door, um, but that's why we're trying to be again as sort of transparent as we can possibly be about where we get the data from, about the limitations of the data, and so forth. Um, and we're trying to sort of piece this together and create and assemble from data something that would give people a, a more nuanced and um, authentic understanding of their surroundings. How many new housing units have been created in your neighborhood in the last 12 months? How does that compare to the citywide average? Um, uh, how have test scores improved at the local schools compared to some other metric, et cetera, et cetera? And if we can, again, work with recurring data and do that in a meaningful way and try to tell interesting stories out of that data, um, we can create a new kind of economy for local news and information. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for us to collaborate. This is simply just one idea. Um, uh, a student here, um, he sent me the, um, Emilio Ferrara, you guys? Okay. So Emilio Ferrara and Alex worked on this paper. Am I allowed to talk about what it is? It said, like, don't talk about it or something on the top of the paper. Like, I guess because it has to be reviewed by anonymous people. Yeah, be general. Okay, be general. So they were examining the corpora of publicly produced documents from minutes from city council meetings, um, uh, you know, memos that government agencies put out, and basically evaluating those on their newsworthiness, right? Well, there's a lot of potential in that kind of work, too, to generate news and news leads. Um, one thing that we have done is that we created a bot to um, look for unusual uh, reports in the crime data that is uh, um, characteristics that deviate several standard deviations from the norm. And so that basically turns up leads. One of the things that we found recently was that, oh, uh, a police officer is suspect. That's an unusual crime uh, entry, right? That the cop is the suspect of the crime. And it turns out here's a cop who was accused of sexual assault, right? And our, 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 uh, our sort of Slack bot that scans this, you know, popped that up for us. We wrote a story about it. Other people picked it up, et cetera, and we were the first ones on that. We do the same thing for hate crimes in Los Angeles, right? Every time there's a hate crime, we generate, automatically generate data about it. Sort of like what you said about sort of sports stories that are automatically generated. We do something similar for hate crimes. We give the typology of that too. And over time, that actually, that data tells a different story, right? So um, I think the cane is about to come out and drag me out of here at this point. You guys have been very kind. They're still awake. Um, so uh, I will end it here, um, but I would love to continue the conversation with folks about how we might be able to collaborate and, and use data as a way of generating news, a way of communicating with people. Have you had any luck getting anything from SoCal Edison? Because I 
just realized like I had a student actually in my class that did an interest. He's a, uh, I forget if he's a PhD student, something, I don't remember exactly mm-hmm. what, but um, getting SoCal Edison data for, and like um, temperature data to try to alert potentially elderly people if they're gonna have like, if there's a heat wave and like their and their and their energy might get shut down or whatever they uh-huh. do it like have you but you said that data was like very protective. So here's what we actually just did. Um, uh, we uh, there's a company called Dark Sky that gives you very granular um, temperature readings. Um, so uh, we're basically have taken that data for 2019 and we're going to continue to get it. And we can say like this is the hottest spot in LA. This is the coolest spot in LA. Um, and as a way of um, just kind of bringing some context to the environment. Um, but that same data could be, you know, repurposed and reused in different ways. Um, for example, with the air quality uh, tracker, um, we could put in alerts so that if you are an asthma sufferer and the PM 2.5 level is going to crest over a certain point, that you're alerted. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways that we can use this data to connect with people, right, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily classically think of it as being news or journalism, but still serves the same function of news and journalism, which is, you know, to inform the public. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's plenty that we can do um, on all sorts of things like that. Water use, land use, emergency room visits, you know, charting PM 2.5 levels and asthma visits to hospitals and looking for correlations there, things like that. Yes, so. I was going to ask a general question. So something that you didn't talk is like the whole false news and kind of right. news and propaganda. So what's your... Okay. Take on that because I mean, you got talk, I mean, I kind of like to talk about the economics mm-hmm. and so on, but I, I think there's a lot of money that okay. is specifically designed to Sorry, influence I, I and create propaganda. So, so, um, so I don't know what's your take. Okay, so the, I have a huge take on that. Um, uh, how much time do you have? So, here's, well, uh, yeah, here's sorry, the, we can talk yeah, afterwards. Here's, think here's, think of it this afternoon, you can, uh, well, but I'll, I'll have a very brief answer. Okay, if quality news is expensive and fake news is cheap, we have a problem, right. And so I mean, that's why I think it's necessary to talk about business models in this. Um, and if we continue to only find ways to produce quality news at a great cost, it's going to be just cheaper. The, the incentives of creating fake news outweigh okay. the incentives of creating Wait, quality you news. You can also do propaganda with actual money. So. <laughs> you can so as well, like, right? So, I mean, but there's Fox a lot of different world. Well, the other thing is, of course, is that, um, RT, that, like that, that one of the reasons why we have what I would call sort of a chronic epidemic of fake news is the role of the, so, of the social media platforms and the functionality of the social media platforms and the way in which they work, right? So they incentivize the creation of fake news because fake news, their goal is to keep you on the platform longer. And by feeding news that sounds true because it fits your profile, is like feeding you ideological comfort food, yeah. right? And there's an incentive of the platform and the producer of fake news that are aligned, right? Um, and the platforms also control all the money, right? Every journalist conference now is sponsored by Google or Facebook, okay? It's, it's, uh, it, it's like, you know, uh, it's like the oil industry sponsoring climate change forums or something, right? Um, uh, and so, th- there, there's a major, major problem there about the way the data is distributed and, and data is used and so forth, yeah. But there's a lot more to that, yeah. Um, but I think, again, part of the issue is that on next door, people can say, I heard this thing happened, right? Um, and that can spread and people can have these non-fact-based conversations. And if we can find an effective way of getting facts at the local level available and accessible to people, that also helps create better terrain for these kinds of conversations. People will tweet or we will, we will send things from their phone, Facebook, right. whatever, on next door. Right. That's kind of the model of Wikipedia. Yeah, in a way, right? Yeah. And they, right, so there's a crowd, there's the incentives around Wikipedia uh, content creation are better than the incentives around Facebook or Twitter or, well, you know, uh, that kind of clearly. Right. All right. Okay, I've talked for a very long time. You guys have been very So there, there are some more spots in the afternoon. You want to